Thank you so much for visiting LifePoint Church online. We want to let you know that if God is doing something special in your life, we would love to hear about it. You can do that by going right to our stories page at visitlifepoint.org forward slash stories. Well, one of the reasons we're able to provide a weekly broadcast just like this is because of the generosity of people just like you. If you would like to support this weekly broadcast, you can do so right on our website. Thanks again for visiting LifePoint Church online. We look forward to hearing a powerful message from the Word of God today. Hey church, we're continuing this series today called Running With the Giants. And we're looking at in this series is what would the giants of the faith, the great men and women that we read about in the scriptures, what would they say to us if they were to come out of heaven and, and run a lap in this run we're on called life? What would they say to us? What wisdom, what insight, what value would they add to our life? And we're able to hear in this series from the incredible preachers and communicators that we have right here in the house. We have some incredibly talented people. And today I am super excited about who you're going to hear from. She is our newest executive on the team. She's been on the team for many years, came as a filmmaker, ended up being the director of our whole creative area. And I recently just involved her into our executive team, being over all the creative arts and just offering insight and wisdom and uh, direction to the overall ministry. And I want to give you a little insight. You won't know this after you hear her, but it's her very first time preaching. The very first time preaching. So she could be a little nervous. I don't know. I'm just saying, could be a little nervous and may need you to show her a whole lot of love to help build up a little bit of confidence. But I'm telling you this, God has put a word in her heart. When she shared it with me, I was amening in my office. I, I threw my notebook, I'll be honest. I got so excited hearing this word. And so I want you to give me some help and show her some love and get up on your feet. I want you to welcome Miss Bethany Euphema to the LifePoint stage. Come on, church, put your hands together. I'm so pumped to be bringing the word to you today. We believe that the word of God is transformative, that it's living and breathing and active. And I believe that the word that God has placed in my heart to share with you that's been transformative in my life over this past month is really going to bring some freedom to somebody in the house today. So I'm pumped to be here. And uh, you can all have a seat at all of our locations. So we have, um, we have a value at LifePoint that says we pull the best out of each other. And I can honestly say that if it wasn't for the leadership of my pastor, Pastor Daniel, identifying the best in me, pulling the best out of me, things that I didn't even know were there sometimes, that I literally wouldn't be standing right here this morning. And so I have tremendous gratitude for his influence in my life, and you just have to know how much he loves you. I have the privilege of working with him throughout the week, and I get to see the passion with which he serves you, how much he believes in you and believes God's best for you and for your family. And so I know because of that love how much he protects this platform. And so I just want to take a minute um, and give honor where honor's due and give it up for our senior pastor, Pastor Daniel. So we are in week two of the series, Running with the Giants, and we got to hear from our worship pastor, Birchman Paul, last week. Didn't he bring an incredible word? Come on. There's so much talent in this house. I'm honored to be a part of what God is doing here. But the whole premise of this series is based out of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and we're going to read it together here on the screen, and it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So the premise of the series is what if one of these giants of the faith, isn't that an incredible thought, by the way, that in the spiritual realms we are literally surrounded by people who are cheering us on, who've gone before us? So what if one of these giants of the faith was to step out of the clouds, so to speak, and run a lap with us? What is the one thing that they would say to us to encourage us to persevere? And the giant of the faith we're going to look at today is King David. Now, David in the Bible is considered to be one of the greatest kings of all time, but not just biblically, also historically. He's the writer of most of the Psalms and one of my favorite people in the scriptures. But he wasn't always king. In fact, the Bible says he began the son of a shepherd and the youngest of eight brothers. 
So he's kind of an unlikely character to have acquired the legacy that he has, and because of that, I think he would have a whole lot to say to us. But if he used to say one thing to us this morning, right now in this very moment, I believe it would be, be bold in your weakness. Turn to your favorite neighbor and say, be bold in your weakness. And so where we enter David's story is in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, and it's the first time that we ever hear David mentioned in the Bible, and it's in his encounter with the giant Goliath. Now, many of you may be familiar with this story, but for those of you who are not, I'm going to paraphrase some, and then we're going to dive into the scriptures. But where we enter the scene is we have King Saul and the Israelite army, who are God's people, and they're at war with the Philistines. And so the Philistine army is over here, but they are at a stalemate. And in between them is a valley. Now, in that valley is a giant named Goliath. And the Bible describes Goliath as a man who is nine feet, nine inches tall. His armor alone weighs 125 pounds. And the iron tip of his spear weighs 15 pounds. So this guy is a literal beast. And for 40 days, 40 days, he stands in this valley and he looks at the Israelite army and he taunts them, saying, send me your best man to fight me your best man, and if you defeat me, we will become your slaves. But if I defeat you, you will become our slaves. So the stakes are pretty high, right? And the Bible says the Israelites were terrified. Nobody moved until a shepherd sends his son David to bring food to three of David's brothers that are in the Israelite encampment. And while he's there, David just happens to hear these taunts of Goliath, and he's appalled. He says, who does this guy think that he is that he can defy the armies of the living God? Now, in an atmosphere of fear, those are some pretty brave words, right? And so King Saul catches wind of David's bravery and he summons him. And so after some debate, David convinces Saul to allow him to fight the Philistine because he believes that God will deliver the giant into his hands. And so this is where we jump into the scriptures We're in verses 37 through 40. If you don't have a Bible, I've got you covered right here. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul. Somebody say, I cannot go in these because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now before we continue, I want to establish one thing. It is quite clear in this passage that David's enemy is a physical one, right? He has a name and it's Goliath, but our enemy is not physical. And it's important to know who our enemy is so that we can properly prepare for battle. Ephesians 6.12 says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Your enemy is not the person in front of you, and it's not the circumstance that you're facing. It can feel like that sometimes, but the Bible says that our battle is spiritual and therefore the battleground is your heart. It's your spirit. That's where the battle's taking place. I was in Africa a few months ago with a small team from LifePoint and I was sitting across from one of the missionaries that we partner with and she was telling me this story about how this other group of missionaries had gone into the bush wearing arrow-proof vests, she said. And I said, arrow-proof? You mean bulletproof? She said, no, arrow-proof. An arrow would go straight through a bulletproof vest. And I felt pretty ignorant in that moment because I didn't even know there was such a thing. And then I thought about it. I said, man, it is important to know the weapons formed against you before you go into battle. So it's important for us to understand who we're fighting, what we're fighting for, and what we're fighting against so that we don't become the slave of our enemy. We don't want to become a slave to fear. We don't want to become a slave to anxiety. We don't want to become a slave to bitterness or unforgiveness, right? So the battle is spiritual and the battleground is our heart. So when we see David entering the battle, the first thing that we see him do is that he goes vulnerable. Go vulnerable. I know that seems a little bit counterintuitive, doesn't it? But King Saul puts his own armor on David. Now, this is a king's armor. This armor has probably saved King Saul's life countless times. But David gets it on his body and he's like, this doesn't feel right. I'm not used to this. This isn't made for me. And so he refuses to wear it. 
But if David had worn that armor in an attempt to cover his weakness, the very thing intended to defend him would have defeated him. And I think, how often do we do this in our life? How often do we try to cover our weaknesses with a false armor? And if the battle I'm talking about is spiritual, the weaknesses I'm talking about is spiritual. And the spiritual weakness I'm referring to is shame. Now, we all have experiences of shame. It's part of being human. Maybe one popped into your mind right now. But what happens is, is we have an experience of shame, and then because of that shame, we feel fear. Because we're terrified that our shame would be exposed. That's the worst thing that could happen, right? And so we build a wall to defend ourselves, to protect ourselves. And that becomes the insecurity through which we live. So I have a feeling that if you can identify an insecurity in your life, you can probably trace it back to a root of shame. I have come to understand shame in my life in this way, and maybe it'll help somebody today. But I have come to understand shame as an awareness of the gap between us and God's perfection. An awareness of the gap between us and God's perfection. We see the first human experience of shame in the book of Genesis chapter 3 all the way back at the beginning. It's the fall of all mankind. Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were forbidden to do. And now God is looking for Adam in the garden. He says, Adam, where are you? Where are you? And Adam says, God, I heard you coming, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And God says, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were naked? Who made you aware? Who awakened you to shame? And so I I think that shame comes to us in three ways. I think shame comes to us by the sin that we commit, right? The sin that we commit lives in the gap between us and God's perfection. It's a divider. I think shame comes to us by actual weaknesses and deficiencies that aren't spiritual. For example, Adam was aware that he was naked. His state of being caused him shame. If you were to walk into your workplace tomorrow not wearing any clothes, you might have a shame experience too, right? And if you don't, that could be another sermon. But I think the third way that we experience shame are those things that are done to us, those things that God never intended for your life, that was not his perfect plan for you, imparted shame to you. I mentioned earlier that um, I grew up in a pastor's home, a small town, a very small town. The town's still small. It's just over 2,000 people or so. And uh, I liken that experience to growing up under a magnifying glass or in a (laughs) fishbowl. And I, I realized early on, or felt early on, that there was this expectation of my life. And it was not something that my parents put on me, but it was something that I experienced nonetheless. And at the same time that I felt that there was this expectation on my life I couldn't quite define, I felt inadequate to live up to it. (laughs) So I felt that there was this invisible mold that I just did not fit. And so those feelings of inadequacy turned into a deep sense of worthlessness. And so to compensate for my worthlessness, I found myself a scale by which I could be measured something quantifiable, and that was school. So if I could see my name with a number next to it and that number was high enough, I could feel a false sense of self-worth. And so I became increasingly rebellious on one hand in my behavior, which only increased my shame, but on the other hand, I became a slave to performance perfectionism. So I graduated eighth grade as valedictorian, I graduated high school as valedictorian, I went on to college and I graduated with highest honors, but this false armor that I was carrying was crushing me. I was forced to leave my freshman year of college because of severe depression, debilitating panic attacks, and anorexia. The thing that I was living under to defend me was actually killing me. And I think, how often are we hiding, right? We all hide. We hide behind our relationships. We hide behind our positions. We hide behind our job titles. We hide behind our talents. Right? We hide behind our senses of humor, our sarcasm. We hide behind our religion. We even hide behind the title Christ follower. But I have a feeling that those of us who are walking around hiding feel like frauds ultimately afraid of rejection. If I can get real right now. And so there's this story in the book of Matthew that I love. And it's about Jesus and this Samaritan woman. And they have an encounter at a well. And it's just the two of them there. 
And in the Bible, the Samaritan woman is described as a woman who's had five husbands. And the man that she is currently with is not her husband. Now, by all accounts in that time and culture, according to that custom, this woman was considered to be scandalous. And then you have Jesus, who's a Jewish rabbi, also the son of God, but a Jewish rabbi who in that time and culture and custom was not supposed to be in the presence of a woman alone, let alone a Samaritan woman, because Jews didn't associate with Samaritans. There was a racial issue. And yet we see Jesus intentionally entering a situation with this woman. Why would Jesus enter what was essentially a scandalous situation to meet a scandalous woman? Why would he do that on purpose? I think he had great intention behind that. I think he wanted her to know that he wasn't intimidated by her shame. I think he wanted her to know that he was willing to meet her at the well of her weakness, at the very root of her rejection, and he loved her. He loved her. And what does she do after she has this love encounter with Jesus? She experiences the love of Jesus, and then she goes running back to the town that she came from, the town that likely ostracized her, and she started proclaiming, come and see. Come and see the man who told me everything that I have ever done. Come and see his name is Jesus. Could he be the Messiah? And suddenly, suddenly this everything that she had ever done that was her shame became the platform on which she began to testify. I want to tell you something, church. God wants you to know something today. What the enemy can keep in the dark, he can keep in the grave. What the enemy can keep in the dark, he can keep in the grave. Don't cover up what Jesus wants to reach in and raise up. He doesn't want to expose you. He wants to resurrect you. He wants to resurrect you. Somebody, somebody this morning needs to trade their shame for his glory, your weakness for his strength. Your testimony is his power. Don't go into battle hiding. Go into battle testifying. Go into battle testifying. It's time for us to strip off this false armor that we have been carrying around that has been crushing our souls. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Bible says my grace is sufficient for you, my power made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. You were never meant to bridge the gap of your shame. You were never meant to bridge that gap. But it was done. It was done for you. And it was done once, and it was done for all, and it was done forever, and it was done perfectly, and it was done on the cross by the blood of Jesus. We need to stop believing the lie that we need to hide from the very God who came out of his throne in heaven into the earth and died in pursuit of you. He's pursuing you. He loves you. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. It doesn't say while we were striving, while we were trying, while we had our good church face on, while we made it look like we had it all together, while we met them halfway. It says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and all that that entails. When Adam was in the garden hiding, what was God doing? He was searching for him. Why was he searching for him? not to condemn him, to clothe him. The Bible says that God himself fashioned clothing out of Adam and, for Adam and Eve out of animal skins to cover their shame, but he didn't stop there. No, he didn't. He took it a step further when he sacrificed his son Jesus, and now we are forever clothed in his righteousness. In his righteousness. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. You've got to be willing to bring to him your mess, and he will take your mess, and he will begin to transform it by his love. If you bring him your vulnerable, he will take your vulnerable, and he will make it valuable. He will make it valuable. Let your shame become the platform from which you preach. But you've got to go vulnerable. The second thing that we see David do is that he goes dependent. Somebody say, go dependent. David didn't come at Goliath in his own strength, in his pride, or what the Bible calls the flesh. He could have. He could have. The Bible says he was young. The Bible says that he had defeated lions and bears in the past by himself. That's pretty tough. The Bible even says that he was good looking. And if the Bible says it unequivocally, you are good looking, right? (laughs) But he didn't. He went dependent on what God would do. 
Because here's the thing, one, one another good reason why it's important to know your enemy is because your enemy knows you. Your enemy can perceive your flesh and your enemy appeals to your flesh. We see this as David approaches Goliath. Goliath sees him coming and the Bible says he despised him. He perceived David, he sized him up. He saw that he was smaller, he saw that he was weaker, he saw that he was unarmed, and so he began to appeal to his flesh, to taunt him, hoping to incite a pride reaction out of David. Because if he could get David to lunge at him, Goliath could easily crush him and Goliath would have been right in his estimation, yeah. right? Yeah. But that's not what David did. And we're going to get to what David did in just a minute, but I want to talk about for a second how easy it is to respond in our pride. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy. It doesn't take any effort at all. It's instinctive. It's like gravity. You tap a ball, it rolls down a hill. It doesn't need any help. Think about the last time that somebody cut you off on 95. What was your knee-jerk reaction? Hopefully you didn't have a life point sticker on your car when you flip them off or cut them off. I'm preaching to myself. And uh, I'm going to tell you this embarrassing story, um, hoping that it's going to help somebody and then God will redeem it. But... <laughs> I was a new mom at the time. Um, I still am a new mom. My daughter's not quite two and a half yet. But I was a newer mom, and she was nine months old, and it was winter time. And so she had on a sweatshirt and sweatpants, but she didn't have socks on her feet. And she didn't have socks on her feet because she refused to wear socks in the season of her life. And I thought about trying to attach them with rubber bands, but I understood that could be, cause some circulation issues, you know. <laughs> so I just decided this wasn't going to be a battle that I was going to fight that day. Moms, you feel me on that. I know you do. So, <laughs> but she had this cough um, that she was overcoming. But, you know, it was lingering, but she was fine. She wasn't sick. So I'm at the grocery store holding her. And this older woman in a motorized shopping cart comes buzzing past me. <laughs> and I can tell by the look on her face that there is like serious judgment radiating in my direction. Like there is something deeply wrong with my person in her estimation. But I just chose to ignore it until I'm standing by the red box machine waiting for my husband to come out of the bathroom. And she rolls past again with who I perceived was her husband. And she mutters something I can't quite understand, but then she says, loud enough for me to hear, like these babies in here who are coughing who don't have any socks on their feet. <laughs> and I say it in that voice to make her sound way worse than she did, but that's how I heard her in that moment. That's what I heard. And I am not kidding you. I experienced that for the first time in my life, that like mother rage. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I was like, I have lost complete control. I have no idea what's going to happen next. I'm like a ravenous animal. And so I yell back at her, she doesn't have socks on her feet because she took them off, which was the truth, but it was not a good comeback. Like, it wasn't even witty at all. And so she yells something back at me, and I yell something back at her, and by this time, my husband has come out of the bathroom, and he's like, what is going on? And I'm like, I am going after her. And he's like, no, you are not. I was like, watch me. She thinks she can buzz past me, start a confrontation, and not finish it face to face. Well, she's never met me. So, it gets worse. So we're like three cars down from her. And her poor husband's just trying to put the groceries in the car, and I'm angrily trying to justify myself to this woman. And it's getting nowhere, so finally I say, well, I'm sure your kids are all happy and loved and well taken care of, and so is mine. Now, I just want to pause for a second and say, if you are this woman and somebody has shown you the love of Christ by inviting you to LifePoint Church, or you are watching online, I would love to meet you down front. I will be here all day and apologize to you. But, The truth is, though, is this woman wasn't actually my enemy. There was nothing that she said or did that was an actual threat to me or my daughter. She just stepped on my insecurity, right? So, so when the enemy perceives me, he sees a five foot, six and a half inch girl with a bad attitude, a reactionary nature, and a defensive posture. And I just became more like myself in that minute and less like Jesus. And more than that, I missed an opportunity to help her win the battle in her heart because clearly she needed some victory in her life, right? We always make matters worse when we respond in our pride. Yeah. We always make it worse. And you know what? We even take pride in our pride. 
How many times have you said this or you've heard somebody say this who are acting a fool? Well, that's just the way that I am, right? There was this meme going around Facebook that said, never water yourself down for someone who can't handle you at 100 proof. And I thought, good Lord, I can't handle me at 100 proof. I'd be a walking hangover. Like I have to decrease so that Jesus can increase, right? So there's this story in the Bible, I think it's one of the saddest stories about pride getting the better of somebody. And it's uh, about Moses in the book of Exodus. And Moses is leading the Israelite people out of the desert into the promised land, but they're not quite there yet. Um, And they're in a dire situation in that they need water. And so this isn't the first time that this has happened. And it's also not the first time that God's about to provide a miracle. So God says to Moses, speak to this rock, and out of this rock, water will flow. But instead of doing the way God commanded, Moses stands in front of the assembly of people and he says, we will bring you water. And he takes his staff and he strikes the rock twice and out of it water flows. Now in that moment, Moses must have thought as he's watching the people drink water that he won the battle doing it his way, right? But it wasn't about the water. It was never about the water. God always planned on providing the water. Moses lost the battle in his heart because of his pride. And because of that, God forbid him to enter the promised land. He was only ever allowed to look at it, but he wasn't allowed to enter. That's sad. That's sad. Let's take a look and see how David reacted to Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47 says this. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. How tough is that? How tough is that? David looks at nine foot, nine inch Goliath, threatens to knock him down and cut his head off, and he doesn't even have a weapon on his body. And if you read on, that's exactly what happens. With one stone, David knocks Goliath in the head. Goliath falls over, and with Goliath's own sword, David finishes him off. So because what David spoke came to pass, what he promised was prophecy, meaning that David wasn't speaking out of empty intimidation. He was speaking from a place of revelation. Revelation was his weapon in that moment. The Bible says that David gathered five smooth stones from a stream, and he put them in his bag. Was that because David didn't think that the first stone would hit his target? I don't think so. The Bible alludes to the fact that Goliath had four brothers, all of whom David and the entire Israelite army would go on to defeat. David had exactly what he needed for battle. And see, while the enemy can perceive you, he cannot perceive what the Lord is doing in you. He's no longer privy to that information. He doesn't sit at the king's table anymore. And so while... Goliath could see David, he couldn't see what was in David's bag, right? So where do we go to get that rock of revelation, that one thing that we need for battle? There's this story about Mary and Martha in the book of Luke. You probably know this one. They're sisters, and Martha is in the kitchen, and she's cooking, and she's cleaning, and she's preparing the house, and she's freaking out because all these people are coming over. And she's freaking out because all these people are coming over because Jesus is there. And so Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, receiving from Jesus, and Martha gets fed up. She says, Jesus, when are you going to tell her to come help me? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, Martha. He says, you're worried about all of these things, but there's only one thing that is needed, one thing indeed, and what Mary has found will not be taken from her. Where do you get that one thing needed, that one thing indeed, that rock of revelation for your battle? You get it at the feet of Jesus. You get it at the feet of Jesus. And what is that one thing that you need today? What is it? Is it hope? Is it encouragement? Is it, is it courage? Is it peace? Is it joy? Is it patience? Is it kindness? Is it goodness? Is it faithfulness? Gentleness or self-control? God knows I need some self-control. You get it at the feet of Jesus. 
and he has it in his hands and he wants to give it to you and he will because he's a good father. He'll give you what you need. He knows what you need and you gotta go get it from him. But more than that, he doesn't just give you what's in his hands. He gives you his heart. He gives you his presence. He goes with you. He doesn't just equip us, he goes with us. Look at what the Bible says. Look at what God says to these giants of the faith that he called in the scriptures. To Isaac, he says, do not be afraid for I am with you, Genesis 26, 24. To Moses, he says, I will be with you, Exodus 3, 12. To Joshua, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Joshua 1, 5. To Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, Judges 6, 12. To his prophet Jeremiah, do not be afraid of them for I am with you and will rescue you, Jeremiah 1, 8. To his servant Jacob, do not fear for I am with you, Isaiah 41. 110. To his prophet Haggai, he says, I am with you, Haggai 113. And to you, he says, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. Be bold in your weakness. His grace is sufficient for you. It's sufficient for you and you and you and you and you. His grace is sufficient for you. Therefore, let us boast all the more gladly about our weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on us. But you gotta go vulnerable and you gotta go dependent. Hebrews 12, one through two that we looked at earlier, it says, throw off everything that hinders. Throw off everything that hinders. That's that false armor that you've been carrying around that's been crushing you. It says, and the sin that so easily entangles, that's the pride that's been getting in your own way. Throw it off. It says, and fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. That means what Jesus has begun in you, he'll be faithful to complete it. He will. But you gotta go vulnerable and you gotta go dependent and be an open vessel through which the Holy Spirit of the living God can flow in and through your life and you will watch him. You will watch him show himself mighty on your behalf. You won't be able to stop what he can do in your life. I want... Um, I want everybody at all of our campuses just to close your eyes for a minute, and our worship team is going to um, sing a song for us. But um, I just believe that the Spirit of God is in this place. I know that He is. He's right where you are, and He's speaking to you right now. He's speaking to you. And if you've never heard His voice before, it doesn't sound like any other, it sounds like truth and it's gentle, and it's like a whisper. And I believe that, I believe that God wants to set somebody free today. I believe that somebody in here has been withholding from the Spirit of God things that they feel are out of His reach of love. And I just wanna tell you, if you receive one thing from this message today, know that there is nothing that you have done, or that was done to you, or that you will do, that can, that can keep his love from you. You are loved, you are fully loved. He is pursuing you and he always has been and he's speaking to you right now and he's saying, let me in. Child of God, let me in. He cannot heal what you do not expose to him. And he wants to because he's a God of freedom and I believe that God is declaring war on darkness today. I believe that the spirit of freedom is setting somebody free in the house today. I believe that somebody in here is gonna walk out with chains on the floor today that we're gonna to have to sweep in the corner because the Spirit of God is doing something in somebody today. And I believe for those of you who have been striving and trying to fight your battles in your own strength and coming up against the same giant again and again and again and losing and losing and losing, maybe you've been fighting the wrong battle. Maybe, maybe the battle's taken place inside of your heart, and you know what? God has what you need. You just gotta go get it from Him. He has what you need. He is powerful to do what you are powerless to do. And He will show Himself mighty on your behalf, and He will take you from victory to victory, from glory to glory. He is able to do it. But you gotta go vulnerable to Him, and you gotta go dependent. He loves you, church. He's for you. He has good things for you. Be bold in your weakness. Once again, we want to say thank you so much for visiting LifePoint Church online. 
Our prayer is that the message today has inspired you to know Jesus on a deeper level. We also hope that you will visit one of our locations in person. While we strive to provide an excellent online experience, nothing quite compares to visiting LifePoint Church in person. Thanks again for joining us. We cannot wait to worship with you next week.